Adventist. Okay, good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah, welcome those to uh, take a seat, if those who are still standing. Um, so wonderful to see all of you once again. Um, always thankful and encouraged uh, to have uh, your, you with us today. I do notice some new faces with us today. So let us stand and let us go around and welcome each other. All right, wow. I just love the bus, you know, as we meet each other every Sunday and thankful for this family that we have in Christ. So this morning, we are going to revisit uh, a passage from the book of Joshua um, that was being preached two weeks ago. And the attribute of God that we will be reflecting on is that God is Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. A brief recap of uh, Joshua 5, 1 to 12, um, which summarizes the journey of the Israelites into the Promised Land. After they left Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And this passage we read of the Lord drying up the river Jordan for them to cross over on dry ground and the hearts of the enemies melting in fear. We also read of the Lord's instructions to Joshua to circumcise the Israelites again and also of the celebration of the Passover. All right, so let us read um, this part uh, of the passage together from Joshua 5, 8 to 12. One, two, go. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gigal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camp at Gigal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So in this journey of the Israelites, we see that it was full of ups and downs, of difficulties and challenges, but we also see God's perfect provision at every step of the way. God provided deliverance from their enemies, for their physical needs in the wilderness and also in the land of Canaan, the circumcision, a sign of God's covenantal love between God and his people, and the Passover pointing towards the perfect provision of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain, who takes away the sin of the world. So this morning as we come before God, let us call to mind his gracious provisions. Let us give thanks and let us worship him. So I invite you to stand with me and let us pray before we give praise to the Lord. Dear God, we praise you for you are Jehovah Jireh, you are God our provider, you are our shield, our exceedingly great reward. In you we lack nothing. 
We thank you for your gracious provisions and we lift up our voices and thanksgiving to you. And we ask that your holy and loving presence fill this place. May you and your name be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's sing and lift our voices. Let's clap together. Let us sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Let's clap together. And blessed be your name In the land that is plentiful Where your streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name And blessed be your name
church. Allow me to pray read from Isaiah 43 and let us claim this promise from God's word. And this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honoured in my sight and because I love you. Dear God, we thank you for these precious promises that are sure and true and we claim them today in Jesus' name. We thank you for this precious time of communion and worship, Lord, and your presence with us. And we ask that, Lord, you continue to be with us and tutor us as we listen to the preaching of your word. We give you all praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite Pastor Joshua to lead us in our Lord's Supper. For God our Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. We are that world. We are part of that world and you have received the Father's love in the Son and because you have belief, you and I have belief, we have today already eternal life, abundant life in Christ. Christ died to bring us to Himself, but not to Himself just as a friend, but that He may pour out His Spirit upon us, into us, that He and us are joined today. There is a difference with reconciliation at a friendship level, at a family level, and reconciliation in the joining, becoming one together. Today, we celebrate. Today, we worship with joy and not just fear because we are one with Christ, one in Christ. But as we remember Christ's love for us, as we remember the Father's gift and the Spirit's presence, I'd like us also to remember that not personally only are we joined to Christ, we are joined as one body to Him, our head. And there is also, while we honour Christ, while we honour His body, we also remember there is much more of the world, our families, our friends, all the people around us that we meet, friends or acquaintances or strangers, who he died too for, but have not yet believed in him. This morning, when we come together as God's people who have placed our faith in him to participate together in obedience to his instructions for the Last Supper, I'd like to us to also, while we remember our salvation in him, pray too for the salvation of our family and our friends and those whom God puts us in touch with. Let's take a few moments now before we participate together as God's family, as God's body, let's take a few moments now to thank Him as we reflect of Christ's great gift of Himself that we may be joined to Him. What is the gospel? What is salvation? As you understand it according to Scripture, Let our hearts, our minds, our lips be full of praise and thanks to God and be reminded 
and grow in faith of this great wonder that God would bring us to Himself. He would live with us, join Himself to us, be in us. And because by the mercy of God we have reconciliation with Him, we also by the mercy of God have this ministry and message of reconciliation. Let us pray now for the people who need to hear, receive and believe this very gospel that we ourselves have heard and believed in. Make an intercession for our family, our friends, to have ears that will hear as the Holy Spirit moves into their life. Make an intercession that they may receive the Word of God when it is sown by His Spirit, by obedient disciples and followers of Christ, and that the seed of His Word and the Gospel will take root in good soil. And now let's together honour Christ as He instructs us, as we follow in obedience to His instructions given to His disciples and the apostles, and to us all also, to participate in remembering Him, in proclaiming His death, and the life that He has given to us through His death. Lord, we honour You this morning as we gather together and affirm our faith in You again. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so Christ, at the Passover with His disciples, took bread, broke it, having given thanks, He says, this is my body, broken for you. Take it, remembering me. I invite you to open up the top layer of your communion element and let's eat together the body of Christ given for us received in faith At the end of his time together with his disciples, he took the cup of the fruit of the vine, pressed deep in red colour, powerfully symbolic of what he was about to do for them, shed and poured out his blood for them. I invite you now, as he did with his disciples, to drink, remembering him. And as many of us have professed our faith in Christ, followed in obedience in baptism, and participated together at the Lord's table, let's continue to follow Him as His disciples and to go and make disciples as He has instructed us, teaching them to obey everything just as we have baptised them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And we ask that the Holy Spirit continue to be alive in all of us not just individually, but together. Almighty God, we honour you because you are perfect, you are all wise, you are all holy, you are all love, and your grace and your mercy has given us the life with you that we have today. 
Teach us now as we continue to pay attention, close attention to your word. And may you speak through our dear brother, Li Wei, that it will be your words that we are hearing through him. Thank you for his time of preparation, his prayer, his journey with you, his meditation to bring us your word. Bless him even as you bless us with the food that will be nourishment to our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before Li Wei come up and share God's word, I will collect our tithes and offerings and it's a very part of our worship to God. The scripture that I'd like to read for us this morning taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. Allow me to lead you in that reading. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do give as he has purpose in his heart not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you who always having all sufficiency in everything, you may always have an abundance for every good day. Do you not agree with me that when you look, partake of the Lord's Supper, when we worship God, we look back at the cross, we are abundantly blessed. When we look at now in this communion of faith, community of faith, you are abundantly blessed. And we look forward to Christ coming. You know that you are assured God takes care of all of us. Amen. So would you give an offering because the word says that you maybe have that abundance so that you can always give for every good deed on earth for the glory of God. So allow me to just give you that two or three minutes to prepare our hearts to give. And then I'll lead you with a thanksgiving prayer for all that God has blessed us with. Let's take that two to three minutes in silence before God. so glad and thankful to inform you uh, because of your faithful tithing and offering and more so because God has provided in and through us uh, even in this month last month we have channeled what we agreed at our AGM our mission giving to many of our partners and time and again they would appreciate they would send thank you uh, for your generous giving for the good deeds that God is doing in and through their missions in other countries. So thank you for your faithful giving. Let us just give thanks again as we think about all that God has blessed us with. Thank you. You have abundantly blessed us, Lord, with every spiritual blessings in Christ. And beyond that, Lord, the spiritual fellowship of people here and the energy, the joy of participating in your kingdom's work right now, reaching out to the lost through our giving. I thank you, God, for blessing us abundantly, materially, physically, in every form, and we look forward to that completion of it all when you come again for us, O oh God. So would you tutor our hearts right now to your word, and we pray a blessing over our children and then our toddlers who are going for their toddlers class, that may their time together, O oh God, will also uncover, learn more about Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. We give thanks again, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So children, you are dismissed for our Sunday school. Uh, toddlers from the age of 6, 12, I think, 16 months to 24, uh, there is a toddler class arranged for all of you. Have a wonderful time.
And for the rest of you, take out your Bible, where the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to invite Levi to come forward. Testing, testing. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. I'm glad to see new faces among us today, for sure. And even old faces, too. So let's take the even the time even uh, after the service itself. Let's do let's take time to gather to get to know even new friends, new faces among our miss, and also the fellowship together. Okay. So even before I start even on our time of learning from the Word, I just want us to do a little bit of, um, how do I say, icebreaker perhaps. Can, uh, can we just break up into small groups of twos or threes, okay? And I just want to ask you all to just share with your partners, what are one or two talents that God has given you? So I think we learned from Pastor Joshua last week that all of us are precious to Him. And in His sovereignty and His grace, He has given us spiritual gifts and He has also given us natural talents, and such as being creative or perhaps with musical skills, being good with children, encouraging others, or just making people feel very welcome in your homes. I think all these are really gifts and talents that God has given to us. So can I just get you all to just break out into two, get a partner or two, get a partner or two, okay? And then just share with each other what are one or two talents that you think God has given to you, okay? Okay, don't take too long. Maybe each person just take one minute to share. Don't need to go one whole long story about your talents, okay? Okay, I hope you had an opportunity to get to hear from each other what are some talents or spiritual gifts that you believe God has given to you. Let's hear from a few people about this, okay? Okay, let's try from all the way at that end over there. Richie, from the people you are sharing with, can you just share what is one of their spiritual gifts or talents? Huh, what, sorry? Who is that? Sean, Sean picks up things fast, very quick to learn, adaptable, right? All right, thanks for sharing that. Let's hear from this side. Maybe Auntie Gurley, <laughs> could you share what is Auntie Lucy's talents or gifts? Ah. 
Wow, okay, so strong in the gift of hospitality. Wow, thank God for that. Maybe let's hear from over here. Let's hear from over here. Maybe Auntie Karen, among your group, what is uh, one gift or talent that, uh, that, that has been shared? Awesome. Shirley has that gift or that, that, that gift of empathy, being able, able to empathize with others. Okay, great. I hope you all have a better understanding of even the people you are sharing with about what are some of their gifts and talents and of course, how, is, how does that relate even to the whole church as, uh, as a whole, which is something we're going to learn today as well. Okay, all right. So as we continue the study of Ephesians chapter 4, okay, I just want to recap again how Paul started this chapter of his letter to the Ephesian Christians. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Okay, can we just read this verse together? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. 1, 2, 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So from this verse, you can see that he started, Paul started with an exhortation to Christians everywhere. That just as he himself willingly faced the hardships of imprisonment out of obedience to God, Likewise, he urges all of us who have put our faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So, of course, the question again is, what is this calling? I think that's the natural question that we have. And you will have to read through Ephesians chapter 1 to 3 again to get the full picture of that calling, okay? But I will summarize this call as the call of the gospel, so which is the good news of God's love and his gift of an abundant, eternal life to all of us through Christ. God's calling saved you and me when we were dead in our trespasses and sins and made us alive with Christ by his grace through faith. I think you all will remember this. And this is God's gift to us and not a result of any good deeds that we did and we could ever do to earn it. And we are saved from the stronghold of sin and death through the power of Christ. I believe this is something we have heard, we have learned, we are familiar with, but I want to reshare with us again the, the importance and how incredible this truth is. And so if this is the calling that you have received and responded to by faith, then we are also to live our lives in a manner worthy of it, which is the message that Paul is bringing us God, through Paul, is bringing us to a from even Ephesians 4 itself. So then, the natural next question, I'm not sure whether you will think, ask yourself is, how are we to live our lives worthy of the calling we have received? And so, this is where Paul wisely gave us insights of how we can do it, which is where the rest of chapter, Ephesians chapter 4 comes in. So, as we have previously learned in the past few sermons, firstly, we are saved into a community, which is the church. And we are task called to make every effort to keep the unity that God has given to us with other believers. So you all remember this, where Pastor Shu has, has shared with us even two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And so that is especially important that part of walking in the manner worthy of the calling we receive is to keep the unity, especially those in the local church that we are now in. And we are also ought to recognize the preciousness of each person to God, that He has given us various gifts, as you have shared and you have recognized from each other. And He has also called us to partner with His Spirit in fulfilling His will through using those gifts. So this is where Pastor Josh has shared with us last week itself. Okay? So this is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, all the way to verse 10. But there is a common theme even in all the way to verse 16. There's this common theme from verse 2 all the way to verse 16 that this aspect of walking in a manner worthy of the calling we receive is to live uh, our lives pursuing love and unity as an end goal. So the, that whole chunk of verse 2 to verse 16, one common theme is to, that God has called us to pursue love and unity as an end goal. And, and we are called to make, and in that sense, we all have different goals in life. I think we recognize that we, each of us may have various goals. Some may seek to pursue comfort and riches. Some will seek to pursue power and respect at work and in society. 
and some will seek to pursue God's purposes and calling for them in this world. So, if you and I understand just how incredible the grace and the love we have received from God and as part of His calling to us, then our goal in life will be to live in a manner worthy of it. And this is where verses 2 to 16 calls us to pursue unity and love to others in the church as one of our end goals in life. So I just want us to understand this overarching end goal that God has called us to in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 to 16. Uh, I believe most of us will know Pastor Edmund Chan from Covenant Evangelical Free Church. He ever once mentioned that his wife's late grandmother used to say to them, your church really loves one another. So in a Cantonese way, she would say to, uh, to her, her daughter and her, her son-in-law, your church really loves one another. And it was through this love that, uh, that, that, they, that she witnessed in the church that led her to receive Christ and to be baptized at the age of 92 years old. This reminds me even of Nai Nai, Rachel and Ruth's late grandmother, who also came to Christ in her old age when she witnessed the love of the church. And so I say this is one of the reasons why love and unity in the church is so important as we seek to live in a manner that is worthy of the calling that we have received. So God did not leave us to try to figure out ourselves how to pursue such a life, seeking unity and love. And that's why He has graciously given us His Spirit and He has given us spiritual gifts to help us do exactly what He calls us to do. So we are not abandoned. God has provided the help that we need in order to do what He has called us to do. And we will be looking at some of these gifts today as we study from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, 11 to 16, okay? But the bigger question is not what those gifts are, but what are we doing with the gifts that God has given to us? That is the bigger question. And so I pray that through even uh, the message today, we may recognize how important it is that we live a life of loving service to one another in order that we grow the church. Okay? So, can I just get you all to open up your Bibles? Let's read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. So you can open up your, either your paper Bibles, your electronic Bibles, or actually you can also look at the screen. But let's make it a habit to open our Bibles every time we hear the Word of God, okay? Okay. Let me read for all of us from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, all right? So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ will be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So from today's passage, I just want to share with us two areas of focus in today's uh, scripture. So the first area of focus I just want to point us to is verse 11, 13 says, the overall theme, overall theme is that Christ equips His people. Okay? And then from verse 14 to 16, the church grows as each part does its work. So this is why I've titled even today's message, How Does the Church Grow? I think we want to understand how God intends for the church to be growing. Okay, and so we're going to learn a bit more about it from verses 11 to 16. Okay, let's look at the first part. Christ equips His people. So as we learn from last week's sermon, each of us are precious to God. Let's not forget that each of us are precious to Him. And so God's grace to each one of us results in us having different spiritual gifts that are determined by His sovereignty. And without God, 
the gifts we have received do no eternal good. Maybe it may be effective or good for some temporary purposes, but if it is not done in God's will and God's power, it does no eternal good. So then we know that these gifts are not given for the benefit of individuals, but these gifts are given to benefit the church as a whole. So we have read from verse 11 earlier on that a few of these gifts that Christ gave to the church are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors or shepherds, and teachers as well. So let me just briefly run through even some what are some, uh, what are some of these gifts and tales when we have them. Okay? Okay, so first and foremost, the apostles are the disciples of Jesus Christ, whom he personally caught when he was on earth and were witnesses of, of his miracles and his doctrine. So this consists of the 12 disciples that we know from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whom Jesus caught, of which one of them, Judas Iscariot, fell away when he betrayed Jesus. But we also read in Acts chapter 1 that another person, Matthias, was called to replace Judas as an apostle. And the criteria for that was that he must be among those who accompanied Jesus throughout the time where Jesus was on earth and, he was, and that he was to be a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So later on, Scripture tells us that Paul himself was also considered as an apostle even though he did not physically accompany Jesus throughout his time on earth, but we know that he was a witness of Jesus' life and resurrection through visions that God gave to him at his conversion. So these are the known apostles, those who are known to have the gifts of apostleship. Okay? And so these apostles, being witnesses to Jesus' life, doctrine, and miracles, were tasked to spread the gospel and to plant and lead churches. And their ministry was accompanied by many works of miracles. Okay, so that's a brief summary of the gift of apostleship. Okay? And the prophets are those gifted in understanding and preaching the Old Testament scriptures and also the foretelling of future matters as God revealed to them. So if we read from Acts chapter 21, there is this prophet called Agabus who foretold the imprisonment of Paul as he was heading to Jerusalem. So we know that this, these are the gifts that the prophets have, the, those who had the gift of prophecy in those days. Okay. Next are the evangelists. The evangelists are those who are especially gifted to proclaim the gospel persuasively and clearly. Yet the work and ministry of evangelism is not limited to these people who are gifted. Because we read from 2 Timothy verse 4 to 5. Paul actually charged Timothy these words. Let me just share with us 2 Timothy verse 4 to 5. Huh? Okay. So in this, in this passage, Paul charged Timothy this. He said, but you keep your head in all situations and your hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So you see, even whether you have the gift of evangelism or not, or whether you're an evangelist or not, the, the call of God is the same. We are called to fulfill the heart of God and His ministry, which is to reach out to the lost, to those who do not, who are facing eternal death apart from Jesus. So we, we are taught to also fulfill this ministry of evangelism on top of whatever else that God has gifted us with. All right? And finally, we come to the gifts of pastors and teachers. These two gifts are related because they both involve instructing believers in God's word and ways. However, pastors have more of a leadership role than teachers as pastors lead by teaching. Okay? And they are especially dedicated to the soul care of believers. So one interesting part about these gifts that uh, we have learned from verse 11 is that they are gifts that also involve leadership positions. So actually, if you can see all these roles, they involve leadership positions in the church itself. They are gifts with a leadership qual uh, qualification to it as well. Okay? So I hope you all can briefly get even some idea of what these gifts entails. But really, beyond understanding what these gifts actually mean or what they have, again, what is more important is what God intends for these gifts to do. And so that's where we read in verse 12 that God's purpose for providing these various gifts to the church is so that every member of the church may be equipped for works of service or ministry. Ministry is in the ESV version. 
so that the body of Christ may be built up. And the goal is that the church is built up into Christ-like maturity. So this brings us to the key point of the gifts that God has given each and every one of us. The gifts God has given us are not intended for personal benefits, but for the purpose of building up the church. And for the church to grow, God's people need to be faithful to God's design and to be involved in works of service and ministry. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, where we have learned previously, okay, says this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God's word makes it very clear that His grace to us as He saves us from death is so that we don't continue to live a mundane, meaningless life, just living for our own worldly comforts and ambitions. But that God has saved us to live purposeful lives that involves doing the good works that He has prepared for us in advance. To know God is to know your life here on earth has a purpose. You are not here by random chance. None of us are here by random chance. Neither are we to live a meaningless existence. So you are here right now, still alive, still listening to me. It means God has a work that He still intends for you to fulfill before He brings you home. So how are we currently involved in doing God's work? Am I a believer who only comes every Sunday to be fed, to be encouraged uh, by the church leaders, but otherwise not using the gifts and the knowledge I have to strengthen or to build others up? Am I someone who feels I'm already so busy with my own work, with my own family, that I have no means and no desire to serve others in this church? There are certainly real and genuine concerns that all of us face in our lives, such as the need to provide for our families, uh, provide for our livelihood, and also the importance of meeting the needs of our families. These are really definitely real, genuine, credible concerns that we have. But if all these concerns result in us thinking, I have nothing to offer to God and to His people because I need all my time, I need all my resources just for my own needs, then perhaps we might have overlooked or forgotten the power of God and His calling behind our salvation. Let me share with us from, Ephes- uh, from Matthew chapter 6, th- verse 33. Jesus tells us this. He said, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So the truth is, does God not, not know what we need? Has God not promised to meet all our needs? And before he even gave this command, Jesus also says in Matthew 6, 25 to 27, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in buns, and in our cases, banks. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? So God tells us this is his power that just as he is mighty to save, he is also more than able to provide for all our needs. And he will do so because we are his children. And he said we are more valuable to him than anything else in all creation. Does God not know that we need food we need clothes, we need a roof over our heads, we need to get good results in school and even to perform well at work. Does God not know all these things? So when Jesus says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well, can we not take Him at His word that when I choose to obey and serve Him, He will be more than able to provide whatever we think 
we may need or we may lose if we were to spend the time and effort for His kingdom's purposes. So how are you currently involved in doing God's work? How are you currently building up His church as He has called you to? So we have learned that to that end, God has given us spiritual leaders such as pastors and teachers who can help provide guidance in order that we may be equipped to serve in whatever ways that God has called us to. So if you desire to obey God in this, but are not certain where to put your time and your energies in God's kingdom, let me encourage you to speak with your pastors, to speak with your ministry leaders who might be able to guide you in this. And even if you are not sure what your spiritual gifts are, as you start to serve, you will come to learn what your gifts are by serving and using them. Okay? And we go on to learn from verse 13 that that the end result of the church being built up is that we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So reaching complete unity, reaching a complete knowledge of Jesus, the Son of God, and having the fullness of Christ can only be attained when we are in heaven. But the point is that we are all works in progress. While we are still on here on earth, we are all works in progress. And God has called us to build each other up in order that while we are still on earth, we may be continually growing in our pursuit of love and unity, becoming more and more mature in our Christ-likeness and our love for Jesus and His saints. So from this verse, let me just share with us the first principle that we can learn in this, is that Christ equips His people for works of service in order to build up the church. Christ equips His people for works of service in order to build up the church. So let me move on now to verse 14 to 16, where the church grows as each part does its work. So now we're going to learn a bit more on this aspect. So as we move to verse 14 to 16, we see that as the church becomes more and more mature, one fruit is that its members will not be easily deceived by false teachers. So this comes about when the church makes it their aim to follow Christ in teaching God's word to each other with their understanding of the word strengthened by the continual study of the Bible. When we first came to know Christ, we may be spiritual infants, okay, without a strong understanding of God and His word. Can you imagine, right? Imagine with me what would happen, right? When you first came to believe in Jesus Christ, but no other Christian made the effort to follow up with you on your newfound faith. But instead, you were left to try to figure out on your own what is Christianity. In such a situation, it will be very easy for a cunning and crafty deceiver to come in and fill you with false ideas of God in order to sway you to his wicked plans. This is actually, unfortunately, what is happening in many cults that uses Jesus' name as their basis for deception. I may, I may have shared before, but when, when Cheryl and I were on holiday in Korea recently, so we struck a conversation with a local tour guide who was driving us around, and we were asking him about his beliefs about Christianity. So he mentioned that according to national statistics, more than half of the Korean population are non-religious. Non-religious, huh? they don't want to believe in anything. When asked about his personal view, why he is part of that statistic, he also doesn't have a faith and he doesn't want to look into it. He mentioned that there are many churches in Korea claiming to be believers of Jesus, but whose teachings lures and destroys the members of their church. Many of these cult leaders deceive their members into believing that they are the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and they are the new Messiah. And they have appeared even to a select few among their churches. Okay? They, these cult leaders claim to speak God's word, but what comes out of their mouths are not from the Bible. So by establishing themselves as God and Savior, these leaders deceive their members into giving up their life savings to them 
and even procure sexual favours from members who believe in their lies. So if I were in their position, I would also understand why nobody wants to believe in Jesus because of all these cults that misuses his name. We know, just, just, a, just a short teaching is that we know for certainty that when Jesus comes again at his second coming, all the world will see him and not just a few select people. You can reference Bible passages such as Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 to 31, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. This tells us that when Jesus comes again, everyone will see him. Okay? But a new believer may not yet know this truth if no one comes alongside them to teach them, to guide them in the truth of God's word during their spiritual infancy. So this is where we learn from verse 15 that when we make the effort to speak God's truth in love to one another, we will grow to become the mature body of Christ who is the head of the church. Thank God for fellow believers in the church who made the effort to befriend and to guide us in our walk with Christ during the times of our spiritual infancy. Can you remember those times when you first came to know Christ and there were others who came alongside you? I know I have definitely benefited from such brothers and sisters in Christ who came alongside me to encourage, to speak God's truth to me, to spur me in my walk with Christ. And these brothers and sisters have also spoken the truth lovingly, especially in my times of sin and failure. Uh, in order to lead me to repentance and the spiritual growth. So we see that speaking the truth in love includes helping one another fight love and uh, fight sin and temptation. We need to be careful that our desire to be nice and to avoid disharmony in our relationships does not cause us to overlook each other's sins and so as a result fail to speak God's truth in love to one another. I remember the days of my youth, not too far away, when I was just entering the army, okay? And there was the constant encouragement and reminder of God's truth from the youth leaders that we should not give up meeting together with the church even when weekends are precious to a full-time NS man. I think all of you who are full-time NS men will know that, okay? Where there is great temptation to spend those weekends on our own activities rather than to meet with the church. And I remember people like Pastor Roy and Pastor Joshua who were the youth leaders at that time, they set the example for the rest of us entering the army to make attending Sunday service and youth fellowship a priority such that when we emerge from the challenges of national service, we are still standing firm in the faith. So that is something I'm really always thankful for because I used to remember that uh, before that, uh, national service was always a cause of concern to the pastors because people would start to leave at that period of time. So the question is, have you likewise been a recipient of someone else who spurred your faith during your spiritual infancy? Have you also experienced what I have experienced? And as you have benefited, is there someone else who can also benefit from you walking alongside in their faith journey? In our fellowship with one another, our conversations mostly about what good food we ate recently, where we have travelled, what's our latest gadgets, etc. and so on and on? Or are we conscious to also take the opportunity to speak God's truth and His love into each other's lives during our times of fellowship? This can be as simple as just asking how your week has been and how can I pray for you during this season? Or you can share what you have learned from reading the Bible during the week. And, or you can share an answered prayer where you saw God at work. In fact, you can also share a worship song with others where the lyrics ministered to you, provided you are very clear, sure the lyrics are based on scripture to the best of your understanding. So in the same way, actually, our pastors have been encouraging all of us to involve ourselves in the four-year Bible reading program in order to help us to mature in our understanding of God's word. This is another one of their initiatives besides preaching the word of God to us each week to help the church become mature and to be equipped for works of service, which includes speaking the truth in love. So have we made it that our aim to grow through the discipline study of God's word so that we can also share it with others as well? Let us live a life worthy of the calling we have received. So all that I have just shared 
are just some examples of how the church grows when each of us chooses to live a life of loving service for the building up of the church. Your pastors and ministry leaders are definitely God's gift to all of us and to the church for the building of the body. But we must recognize God's word tells us they are not called to be the only ones to serve. Rather, God's word says we are all to be involved in ministry, every member of the church. God desires for every member to serve in the ways that he has gifted us to. And he has said that all of us who are members of Christ's body are called to work on ministry in order that we may all grow to become the mature body of Christ, who is the head. Just as a human body is powerless to do anything if it's not connected to the head, likewise, it is through Christ from whom we receive life, power, and love through the Holy Spirit that empowers us to be united to His body and to be able to serve where He calls us to. And this is where we look into the last verse, verse 16, for from Jesus Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so as I mentioned earlier on, the church cannot grow if only a small part of the body is working and the rest of the body is sleeping. If you have ever wondered why the church is not growing, then we must also ask ourselves this question, am I doing my part to serve in an area of ministry that supports the growth of the body. That service can be to support the local church, which is X, such as responding to the call to support various ministries that Pastor Roy has shared with us in the past few weeks. Or you could serve beyond the local church in support of the universal church, like serving in parachurch organizations like BSF or Singapore Youth for Christ, or even in the Jurong Outreach Ministry where Pastor Josh is heading. But we also recognize that fruitful service is only possible when Christ is the power and the reason for the service. It starts with knowing Jesus. Knowing God's love for you and me needs to be the motivation behind our service. It comes from constantly being reminded of the gospel, that Christ died on the cross to save us, not because we deserve it, but because of His grace, out of His love for you and for me. And His love endures forever. When we are constantly reminded how much God loves us as we read His word and as we understand and hear the gospel constantly, his love will so fill our hearts such that we can obey His command to love one another as well, which reveals itself in loving service to the church, which is His body. And so from here, let me just share with us a second principle that we can learn from these verses is that the church grows as each part does its work in God's love. So in conclusion, I just want to ask us to think about a few questions, okay? So as you can see on the screen, so what are the talents and spiritual gifts that God has given you? I think you, are, you may have already answered that earlier on, okay? How have you been strengthened and equipped by spiritual leaders and teachers that God has put in your life? So as I have shared even from my own experience, I believe most of us has also experienced something similar. Can you recall those times? And can we be so grateful for how God brought along these spiritual mentors, pastors, teachers, leaders to walk alongside us? Then we ask ourselves, how are you involved in building up the body of Christ with all that God has given to you? And perhaps I know quite a number of us are already serving in many ways, but Perhaps is God maybe currently challenging you to serve in an area of ministry that is beyond your comfort zone? Perhaps whatever you are doing now, have you been so comfortable at it that you are hearing God's call now to ask you to serve beyond that? So which of His promises can give you assurance 
that you obey Him in this call. So knowing God's promises can give us the confidence and assurance that God will do exactly as He called us to do. And He will equip, He will provide for us all that we need. So as mentioned earlier, Christ has given the church the spiritual gift of pastors and teachers for the equipping of His saints for the work of ministry. So again, if you are wondering, how can you be involved in building up the body of Christ? Or if you are wrestling with a certain call from God, I would encourage us to speak with your pastors or your ministry leaders who can pray alongside you and provide spiritual advice as well. So we learned that Christ, uh, and oh, before I go into that, even before we consider what spiritual gifts that we have been given, the more important question is, do you know how much God loves you? Have you received the greatest gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ died to give you out of His love? If any of us have not known or received this greatest of gifts, let me just encourage you to speak with someone in this church, perhaps next to you, perhaps the pastors, in order that you may know how you may receive this good news of life in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest gift that we must first recognize and receive before we even consider where else God may be calling us to. So we have learned that Christ equips His people for works of service in order to build up the church. And the church grows as each part does its work in God's love. Let us consider how we may apply even these truths in our lives in order that you and I can see how God will grow us individually and as a church to fulfill the purposes that He has called us to until the day of His second coming. I hope and I pray that on the day then when we all see Jesus face to face, may we be able to joyously look forward to have Jesus tell us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. Because that is the hope and the joy that we want to look forward to when we see Him for all eternity. Right? Let me just pray for all of us even as we conclude this time together. Dear Lord Jesus, once again, I, I just want to be reminded, God, how much You have loved us not because we deserve anything, not because we are good enough to deserve you dying on the cross for us, but you chose to die on that cross. You chose to give up your life on that cross because you love us with an unending, unfailing love. And your grace to us is higher than the heavens, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, indeed we are able to be gathered here even on a Sunday, every day, Lord, because of your love that builds up this church. This church comes about because you have died for her and you have brought it together. And you have said that you are now empowering the church to continue to grow with the many various gifts that you have given to us through the Spirit. I pray, dear God, would you graciously continue to help us to recognize and to know these gifts, Lord, that you've given to each and every individual member of the body. And would you strengthen our hearts and our minds to trust you, to believe in your promise that when we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, all these things will be given to us as well. Every single need that we have, God, you are more than able to provide. As long as we just trust you in this area. And so I, I pray, dear God, would you graciously continue to build up your church, build up X, and through X also to build up the universal church, that we may all grow through the exercise of the gifts you have given to us. And may you cause us, dear Lord, to so remember the love we have received from you that we are making our lives go also to pursue unity in the church and to pursue love for one another as one of our end goals in life. Lord, I pray, may it not be 
the world, the, the concerns or the, or the desires for the world's riches that fills our minds and our, and our attitudes, but really maybe your love that constantly prompts us, empowers us, and leads us to pursue unity and love in the body of Christ, such that this world will see your love through the love that is found in our church, O oh God. So thank you, God, because we know that in our own human strength, we cannot accomplish any of this, but you are there with us. And you have promised you will provide all that we need in order that we may fulfill even the purposes and the calling that you are given to us. So would you continue to lead us? Would you continue to empower us? And would you continue to glorify yourself, O oh Lord, through your church, through your people, and lead us to love as you have loved us as well? So we give you thanks, dear God, because in all of this, we know we have the empowerment and we know we have your blessings through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. That's all right.